I am so glad to be able to start the book of Luke today with you. What a great adventure it is for me to go back through the book and actually see it from a historical background and dig deeper into some of the, the finer points. And I, I have to tell you, I'm rather excited about it. Um, so my, my cover slide here shows Luke, the other Luke you know. It's actually a picture of Luke Skywalker. <coughs> but he looks like he could be Dr. Luke in the first century. Yeah. So I, I did my best to obscure his identity. But then I told you so. I guess it means nothing. The book of Luke, please pray with me. Father, this morning, we thank you for the opportunity to get into your word and specifically into this gospel of Luke. We pray that you'd give us wisdom, Lord, that you'd help us to understand that you might soften our hearts as well as sharpen our minds. That you might focus our spirits upon you, that you would help us to understand more of who you are and, Lord, how you see us. Thank you for the opportunity to be here. Thank you for all of these healthy and happy people. I pray, Lord, that your spirit would move among us this morning as we see you afresh in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we are in the book of Luke in the beginning chapter. And of course, usually the first Sunday of going into a new book involves a lot of historical wisdom and knowledge, which I don't possess, so I have to read. And so my mind is full of facts and figures, which I have spared you <laughs> the majority of. So I, I hope that you're happy. Um, Luke, of course, uh, number three, Matthew, Mark, and Luke of the four Gospels. Luke comes at things from a different point of view. It's interesting when God uses a person and inspires someone to write something, you're always going to get the flavor of the vessel. And if you write with pen, it has a very distinctive look. If you write with pencil, it has a very distinctive look. If you, if you draw with crayon like I do, <laughs> it looks very specific or with markers that have permanent ink. All of these things, although you are the writer, the instrument that you use has a flavor and has a characteristic of its own. And so the book of Luke is that way as the Holy Spirit moves him along to write these accounts. He's very different from the other writers. And as we go through that, we're going to see it. I've picked a highlight scripture for today in Luke 117. He will also go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah. You know who he's talking about? John the Baptist. To turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just, to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. This was the angel Gabriel as, she annou as he announced to um, Zechariah's wife, uh, or Zechariah rather, and then Zechariah to his wife about his being born and who he would be and what his identity would be. Wouldn't that be a cool thing if everybody had that benefit? The Lord would speak to you and say he's going to be rebellious and tough and make sure you spank him a lot or, you know, he's going to be awesome and great. Um, so... As we look at the book of Luke, I'm just going to give you a couple of introductory things. Luke is the good doctor. He's uh, known as the beloved doctor, actually, by Paul, as he writes in Timothy. Uh, he's a Gentile. So he is the only Gentile writing scripture, just so that you're aware. Everybody else is Jewish. Even John the Baptist, even though he's a Baptist, he's Jewish. He's the only... He's the only Gentile writer in the scriptures, and he is the most prolific. Believe it or not, Luke has written more words than even the Apostle Paul. If you add up the entire book of Acts, which is essentially the second chapter of Luke, the second book of Luke, um, you'll see that he actually has the most amount of words, even over and above the Apostle Paul, which I was amazed to find. I figured Paul... You know, he's kind of the lion's share of the scriptures, but it's actually Luke. He writes in the highest form of Greek, uh, just like I don't speak in the highest form of English. The other writers don't have the same level of Greek articulateness 
as Luke does. And we're going to see that especially in the first four verses, which is actually one entire sentence. So he has a problem with punctuation as well, like Paul. So as we get into this, we're going to see that he appeals to the common man, though, even though he speaks in this the high and lofty language of, you know, like if I had an English accent and I could pretend it well, uh, that's the way he is. And you would think this from someone who's a doctor who has a formal education, who's been educated in the arts and in language and in medicine, which he is. And the highlights that Luke brings out are about the common person. And you're going to see women, children, centurions, uh, lost sons, lost coins, all of these things are original to the book of Luke and no one else speaks of them. You're going to see a lot of history in the beginning that Luke brings out that none of the other writers bring out. We have the Christmas story. We have the Magi. We have all of that because of the book of Luke, which we wouldn't have if Luke didn't write his gospel. He takes a completely different tack. Matthew, of course, traveled with Jesus, and so he's got a firsthand account of what's going on. But you remember what Matthew was. He was Levi, the tax collector. So he's got this very fastidious, detail-oriented mind, but he's also a Jew. And so he sees Jesus as the Messiah, the coming king of Israel. And so he writes, and you have, you have so many passages that... Uh, reference the Old Testament in the book of Matthew, where you're not going to have that so much in Luke. Luke is bigger on parables. And so we're going to see, because it appeals to the Greek mind. Luke is written more to the Greek. Matthew is written more to the Jew. The book of Mark, if you remember John Mark, who was a quitter for Paul, but then was redeemed and discipled by Peter, essentially writes down Peter's testimony about who Jesus was, and that's the book of Mark. The more common words you'll find in the book of Mark are immediately. Immediately Jesus this and immediately Jesus did that. These are sort of military terms that somebody who's a Roman would, would kind of key in on. And this is just the way he wrote. And that's the flavor of Mark. He sees Jesus as a servant. He sees him as somebody who serves and a man of action. So immediately Jesus did this and immediately he was made you know, whole and immediately you get all these, it's kind of like, okay, okay, all right, all right, let's go, let's go. It, it, when I read through it, it makes, makes me kind of want to do something instead of sit there reading. I don't know why, it just does. <laughs> Luke appeals to the common man, and he has stories that will do that. And it is the gospel of women, because there are women mentioned more in Luke than in any other of the gospels. So it's, it's a real interesting thing that Luke comes at this with a big heart. He takes the forgotten... And with great detail and compassion, he will explain all of these things and some of the deeper insights. You'll also see him give diagnoses. Jesus walks up to someone who is deaf and mute, and he'll give the diagnosis. He'll, he, he heals somebody with leprosy. He'll name leprosy as a disease because he's a doctor. Of course, he's got to do that. He won't say they had a skin condition. You know, or, or they had an, a skin ailment. He'll mention it specifically what it was. And he goes and he gets details. He says, you know, give me the facts, ma'am, just the facts. And he writes them down. And he's got all of this first-person testimony where he's sitting down and he's researching all these things like a reporter. And he's going to give you kind of a doctor's flavor as a reporter, which is, which is really interesting to me. He views Christ as the son of man. It's mentioned 25 times in the book of Luke, and he brings out his humanity. Luke brings out the human side of Jesus, where you will see the divinity of Jesus brought out, let's say, in the book of John. John sees him as the son of God come from heaven, and he focuses on the deity of Jesus Christ. Here in the book of Luke, we're looking at the humanity of Jesus Christ, and it's something that Luke does, and it ties us all in as we read through it. If he was Christ as the son of man, he brings out his humanity and he's a traveling companion of Paul the apostle. Right around Acts chapter 15, as Luke is writing, he begins to say, we went here and we went there, indicating that that's when he joins the apostle Paul. Some believe that Luke came alongside and wrote the book of Acts as a defense for Paul when he went to Rome. 
And so put down all of this information and handed it off so that it could be read and he could defend himself before Caesar. So all of these things, as we go through the book of Luke, there's all kinds of deep historical truths that we can learn, but there's a lot of really good spiritual stuff in here too. So let's pick it up in verse one. These four verses are one sentence in the original Greek, and it probably was a tag that he put on after the book was written, kind of summating it, which is helpful when you're reading it. And as much as many have undertaken in hand to set in order a narrative of those things which have been fulfilled among us, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word delivered them to us, it seemed good to me also, having had perfect understanding of all things from the very first, to write to you an orderly account, most excellent Theophilus, that you may know the certainty of the things in which you were instructed. This, this sentence is written in the highest form of Greek that there is. It's a very complex sentence and a lot of explanation. Let's kind of pick it apart. He's telling you that the things that Theophilus has heard, this is based on fact. And I did a fact-finding tour so that you might know the truth of it, that you're not led astray by people who are spreading stories orally and didn't get it straight. So what I did is I went and I interviewed these people. I have first-person accounts in this book that are going to tell you exactly what happened because I don't want anybody believing something that's false. Now, isn't that a good thing to do? If you want to know really what happened, you're going to go get the facts and you're going to talk to the people who know. First-hand information. It's not based on fantasy. Evidence is gathered from eyewitnesses and reliable sources of truth. This is not second, third-hand information. This was not written two centuries after it occurred. This is very much close to the time when Jesus died. So we have this as, a, as a, a fact, actually. They have uncovered old manuscripts that are now been dated very close to the time of Christ, not two centuries, three centuries after. There are people that will tell you you can't believe the Bible because it was written so far after it wasn't. They're, they're not telling you the truth. And it's not just, infor ins it's not just information, it's inspiration. Because he says here, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses, ministers of the word delivered them to us, it seemed good to me also having a perfect understanding. In other words, I researched this thing thoroughly of the things from the very first. Actually, what that means is that he was inspired by the spirit of God above all from the first, from God himself. So he's attributing inspiration as well to what he's writing and giving an orderly account. This is addressed to Theophilus along with the book of Acts. You guys know who Theophilus is, right? Some people believe that he was a Byzantine uh, ruler. Well, the Byzantine uh, era didn't occur until 500 AD, so it couldn't have been that. Um, it, but he very probably was a Greek. Some believe that he was. His name is Theophilus, which probably wasn't his given name. Theophilus means lover of God. And so he's writing to someone who is known as a lover of God. I, I like to think it, he was writing it to you. Right? You have to understand the time in which it was written. There was a lot of persecution of Christians. And so if you were going to write somebody's name, address, and phone number on this thing, you know that if, if they got caught, they would be thrown to the lions or they would be executed. So it might just be a nickname that he's sending out to Theophilus, most excellent Theophilus. There are some people who believe he was Luke's former owner. Yes, they had slavery, and people would own their own doctor. Isn't that cool? That you could own your own doctor, because now doctors own us. <laughs> so I guess the shoe's on the other foot. The pendulum swings. So, but 
some people believe that it was his former owner who released him, who had come to Christ and released Luke to go and research this stuff as he went with Paul, which he ended up doing. So all of these things are conjecture and there isn't any solid historical fact for any of it. So I like to think that this is written for me, a lover of God. Jesus calls us his friends because we're, we're the ones who obey him and do what he says. And so I, I like to think of myself as a lover of God. And so I hope you do as well. And I hope you take this book to heart that it's written to you as a lover of God. And then he states his purpose for writing the book, that you may know the certainty of those things in which you were instructed. Uh, the word instructed is, is catechorizo, where we get catechism from. So this Theophilus, or unless it's a group of people or a church, uh, those lovers of God in the plural, they may have been instructed in the scriptures and wondered, hmm, I wonder if this is really true. I wonder if this could have really happened. I wonder if Jesus really rose from the dead. These are all questions that we've had in the past, right? I wonder how much of this is true and, you know, do people make up this religion? If I was going to make up a religion, I would make myself look really, really good in the book. But none of the disciples look good. None of them are stellar. All of their faults and flaws, Peter <laughs> denied Christ three times. You know, you, you look over all of them and they're, they're arguing over who's the greatest. And, uh, you know, they're telling little children, stay away from Jesus. Don't bother the man. He's working. He's working. Come on, get out of the way. Would you write that stuff about yourself if you were making up a story? No, we write stuff like Marvel comic books, you know, and we <laughs> make ourselves look like heroes, you know. Yes. These are actual factual things, and this is a certainty of things that we have been instructed in, so it's going to help us to understand really what occurred. Verse 5, there was in the days of Herod, the king of Judea, a certain priest named Zechariah of the division of Abijah. His wife was of the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. They were both righteous before God, walking in all the commandments and ordinances of, of the Lord, blameless. Well, so we're given a time period, and this is Herod the Great. Herod the Great wasn't so great, by the way. He had 10 wives, killed one just because he felt like it, killed some of his own children because he felt that they were a challenge to his power. He was a power-hungry, insecure dude. He gave himself the name Herod the Great. Herod's actually a position. It's a king, okay? But he was, he gave himself the name, I'm, I'm awesome, I'm magnanimous, I'm fantastic. Um, and boy, wouldn't it be good if you could just make your own name up? But he did. So we know it was around the time of Herod the Great, so we're given a time period. Why is that? Because Luke is very fastidious about facts. And we're told about Zechariah and Elizabeth. These are two old folk who are doing the right thing in the right place. He's got a righteous ministry. This guy's a working man. Ladies, if you're going to marry somebody, marry a working man, right? Guy that's got a job. It's a good, it's a good thing. So she finds a good man because he's in the ministry, and he, we know that he's of a right lineage. So he's coming from the right family. She's coming from the right family. She comes from the line of Aaron. So she, too, can trace back her lineage to a very prestigious point in history. You have this very righteous life where they're doing everything that they're supposed to do. And I misspelled life. <laughs> no, it's line. They're in a righteous line. Okay? <laughs> They've got, they've got religiosity that goes all the way back to, to Moses and Aaron, and they have a righteous life. I'm, I'm a bonehead. So <laughs> they've got all of this going on. And so we're introduced to these folks at a period in time, and Zechariah is doing his business. I want you to notice all the details. We know when, we know where, we know who, we've got their family line all of these details are being spelled out, and you're not going to necessarily get this from the other Gospels. So you've got all these details just to show you this is Luke's style as we go through. But they had no child, so we got all the good news up front because Elizabeth was barren. They were both well advanced in years. <laughs> the uh, King James says they were stricken with years, which means... <laughs> The word actually means they were bent over. That's what the word means. 
So when it says they were advanced in years, it means that they were bent over. So the King James is being kind. You know when time is not kind to you? I have pictures when I was younger, I know. <laughs> they were advanced in years, and so it was that while he was serving as priest before God in the order of his division, according to the custom of the priesthood, his lot fell to burn incense. And he went into the temple. The people was praying outside the hour of incense. Here's the deal. There's 24 divisions of priests. And so they're able to swap through and they have, they get to go and serve in the temple. There's about 22,000 priests at this point in time. And so everybody wants to get a chance to serve in the temple, right? And even if it's just to light incense, even if it's just to be there and to pray for the people. And so they're rotating through. And it just so happens, just so happens, that at this particular time, that he's the particular guy whose lot drew and he was able to go and burn incense. Just so happened that his troop was the ones who were overseeing the temple at this point in time. God is using all of these circumstances because he has a plan. And it's amazing, we don't know of all of those wonderful circumstances and chance things until you look back and you go, wow. You ever do that? You look back and you say, wow, God really had his hand on me. So all of this is going on and we're given the bad news. Elizabeth hasn't had any children and they're way past due. So it, it's not going to happen. But we've heard about this before, right? Sarah, Hannah. We, we, we've found barren people in the scriptures that have children and Sarah was 99. So these folks could have been extremely old. We know that they were stricken. They were hung over, if you will. You ever felt like you have everything and yet you have nothing? I wonder if that's how they felt. And I wonder if that isn't why Luke told us they come from a good line. He's doing a good job. They're living a good life. Everything they're doing is right, and yet they don't have any children. You know, it was a common understanding that if you didn't have children, it was God punishing you. Luke is dispelling that rumor right now. These guys are doing everything right, and they don't have any children. Why is that? Because God has a plan, and his plan is better than yours. And he knows exactly what he's doing, and he has a timing and a schedule that you don't know. But I imagine as they go through their lives and as they're doing all these things for God, in the back of their mind, you know that they're praying hard for a child, or at least they used to. But it's all gone. And now they're just going about serving the Lord out of faith, just raw faith, not knowing why, but just going about doing what God's called them to do, and yet feeling this lack you know what that's like? When everybody around you says you've got everything except for this one thing, and it's that one thing that kind of defines you, it can be a very difficult thing. And whatever the tragedy is for you, know that God has a plan, and you don't know necessarily all of it. You just know a piece of it. So you might feel like you're doing everything right, and yet God hasn't given you the desire of your heart. And I think that's what the picture is that is being painted for us. There's this one thing that they've never had as children, and it's, it's a grievous thing to bear. So, verse 11, then an angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And when Zechariah saw him, he was troubled, and fear fell upon him. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer is heard. What prayer? A million years ago I prayed. You're showing up now? You see, he's going to the altar of incense and there are two other priests with him. One is carrying coal and one is carrying incense. And they give it to him and as he goes through and he goes to the altar, they leave and he's alone. He puts the coals on this golden altar 
and he takes the incense and he puts the incense on top and the incense begins to burn and fill the air and he begins to raise his hands and pray for the people. This is when he opens his eyes and he notices he's not alone. There's an angel. Do they wear name tags? I imagine this angel didn't look like anybody he's ever seen. I don't think they're effeminized versions of men. I don't think they're women. It's not Gabrielle, it's Gabriel. Gabriel, Gabe, he's a man, man's name, by the way. And he shows up, and he's now going to have a conversation with Zechariah as he's on duty. And Zechariah is suddenly stunned, which I would be. If I looked up from my desk in the middle of the night and saw some kind of a human being that looked kind of human but looked kind of supernatural, that would freak me out. And I'd wonder, what did I do wrong? <laughs> I'd be looking for a sword. Is this Michael or Gabriel? Because, you know, if it's Michael, I'm toast. Because he's the archangel. He comes and he does battle. I'm in deep trouble. Luckily, it's Gabriel. That's the one you want to see. If you got to see an angel, Gabriel's the one. He's the announcer. He's the one who always brings messages. If you go all the way back to Daniel, you'll see it's Gabriel who's the, he's the mail delivery guy, you know. <laughs> delivery for Mungo, you know, so he's delivering mail. <laughs> and that's good. You, you, that's what you want because what Michael comes with is a sword and it's usually to do, uh, you know, it's usually to hurt you. So Zachariah saw him and he was troubled and fear fell upon him. But the angel said to him, do not be afraid, Zacharias. For your prayer is heard, and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you shall call his name John. What? <laughs> Stricken. Old. What are you talking about? You heard my prayer. What? You're a little late. You ever feel like God answers your prayers, but a little late? Say, what? Now? You mean now? In my old age, I'm going to have children? Really? Where's Glenn Fox when I need him? <laughs> so this angel shows up and he says, I got a message for you. You're going to have a child. He's in the midst of making this incense and praying for the people. And he says, your prayer has been heard. Well, I, it's kind of why I was praying and burning incense because I'm thinking you're going to hear my prayer. So that, that's great. But he didn't mean that. What he meant was the prayer that you used to pray, which tells me there's probably a point at which God wants us to pray, and at some point, he just tips the bowl and, and answers those prayers, and only he knows the timing of that. I think maybe one day we'll understand how we have fallen short by not praying as we should. And I just wonder how all that's going to play out. But this incense is to represent the prayers of the people. And here he is doing his job and praying. This angel comes and he's listening. He says, so John, huh? I'm going to have a baby now. Zachariah's name, by the way, means Jehovah remembers. And Elizabeth means the oath of God. Jehovah remembers the oath of God. You thought I forgot you, right? You thought when I spoke to you and told you it was going to happen that it was going to happen immediately and it didn't. Jehovah remembers the oath of God. And I want you to name him John. By the way, in this culture, you don't ever name somebody some random thing. You know, I think I'll call them... September, you know, you don't just pick an arbitrary name. Usually it's a family name. It's something that your father had or your grandfather had and you keep it in the family line. And some, sometimes they even go back and forth, you know, so if you're a John, you become a Jacob. If you're a Jacob, you name your child John. And so you have this kind of every other generation having the same name. Or if you're like me, you pass it on to your son who passes it on to his son and you start getting Roman numerals and you get mail you shouldn't get. So... <laughs> So he says, I want you to name him John. By the way, John means Jehovah is a gracious giver. Jehovah is a gracious giver. 
Jehovah remembers the oath of God. <laughs> and Jehovah is a gracious giver. Here's this gift that God's going to give them, and I want you to name him Gift. <laughs> That's an appropriate name, isn't it? And you will have joy and gladness. He's probably not having the joy and gladness at this moment. But you will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth, for he will be great. I always want to say that with a, an Irish accent or, or Scottish accent. He'll be great. <laughs> he will be great in the sight of the Lord and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink. You know why? He will be filled with the Holy Spirit even from his mother's womb. You know, once something's filled, you, you don't fill it up anymore. And he will turn away to the children, and he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. He will also go before him, capital H, meaning the Messiah, in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Wow. I'm not just giving you a son. I'm giving you a son that's got a future. And he's going to give a future and a hope to all the people of Israel. And he is the one that the scriptures have spoken about, that he will come in the spirit and power of Elijah to lead the way for the Messiah to come. That's pretty exact information. Can you imagine Luke's writing all this down? I would have loved to be there for those interviews. It's interesting that the angel references the last verse that we have in the Old Testament. You have to know at this period of time, there was 400 silent years up to this point. There was no prophet. There was no word from God. There was no supernatural event. There was nothing. Crickets for 400 years. The first contact God makes with a human being is right here with Zechariah. And what the angel references is the last verse in the Old Testament, announcing the last prophet, who would be John. In Malachi 4, 6 to 7, uh, 4, 5, and 6, it says, Behold, I will send you Elijah, the prophet, before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to their fathers lest I come and strike the earth with a curse. Do you realize that the last word in the Old Testament is curse? I look back at the Old Testament, and at the inauguration of the law, there were 3,000 that died. At the inauguration of the church, there were 3,000 that lived in the second chapter of Acts, when they got saved and they got baptized. Very different covenant. But this is the, the warning that, that stands at the end of Malachi, or Malachi, if, if you think he's Italian. <laughs> he says, this is who he's going to be. And I picked that picture of Zechariah because it looks a little smug. And Zechariah said to the angel, how shall I know this? In other words, how can I believe this? For I am old. I'm an old man. And my wife is well advanced in years. That's that word stricken again. I'm old, but man, she's really old. <laughs> and the angel answered and said to him, I'm Gabriel who stands in the presence of God and was sent to speak to you and bring you these glad tidings. You get the idea he's a little ticked? You, you what? You don't believe what I'm telling you? I'm Gabriel, man. Don't you know me? What, do you need a business card? Gabriel means God is my strength. And from what I understand about angels, I don't want to mess with them. 
He deserves a little respect. Angels need respect too, not just men. I am Gabriel who stands in the presence of God and was sent to speak to you and bring you these glad tidings. But behold, you will be mute and not able to speak until the day these things take place because you did not believe my words, which will be fulfilled in their time. And so, you don't believe my words, there's no sense in you using any. Or in the words of Thumper, if you can't say anything nice, then don't say anything at all. He couldn't say anything nice, and so he's not going to say anything at all for nine months. That's going to make it difficult to do a lot of things. So, did you ever not believe something that the Lord told you? That he spoke in his word when you heard from a loving and well, um, should be well-received brother or sister in Christ? Be careful. If God speaks something to you, you should receive it and believe it. And the people, oh yeah, by the way, this is all happening as he's ministering and praying for the people. And the people waited for Zacharias and marveled that he had lingered long in the temple. Kind of like three hours later, there are still people here at church. Well, how does that happen on a Sunday? <laughs> but when he came out, he could not speak to them. And they perceived that he had seen a vision in the temple. For he beckoned to them and remained speechless. So it was as soon as the days of his service were completed, he departed to his own house. And now after those days, his wife Elizabeth conceived. And she hid herself for five months, saying, thus the Lord has dealt with me in the days when he looked on me to take away my reproach among the people. It's a very interesting passage. Can you imagine Zechariah coming out and seeing all of his fellow priests and all of the people that were out there and he's <laughs> trying to explain what happened, playing Pictionary with everyone in the temple? <laughs> they, they got something happened, but they, they, he saw a vision or something, you know, because, you know, the, that's when you need, you know, you need these little, these little guys right here. You need, so you can communicate. So he tries to explain what happened. And then he finishes his duty and he goes home. How do you explain that to your wife? That's a, that's a blackboard, you know, with like a lifetime supply of chalk. So he explains to his wife what happens. And she gets pregnant which involves some effort. I can only imagine the conversation. We're old and stricken in years, but the angel said, and you see, there's this beautiful thing where God is at work and yet there's a human component. There's the sovereignty of God, and then there's the free will of man and how they work together so beautifully. And in this case, very beautifully. And so she gets pregnant, and she hides herself for five months. I can, I can only imagine the conversations that they're having, you know. Look what you did to me. <laughs> and he said, nothing. Nothing. <laughs> because he can't say anything. Because at one point he said too much. Men, that's it's actually a very good way to stay out of trouble. Say less. What you should have said was nothing. So she hides herself for five months. Why does she hide herself for five months? Hmm. I have an opinion. Because if you're pregnant and you're stricken in years, you're going to have to explain this to people. 
And it's better just to stay home and not have to explain this to everybody. Well, you see, my husband met an angel when he was on duty at the temple. And the angel said, this, we're going to name him. We already have his name because he wrote it down for me. And, you know, he explained all this. And then, you know, nature took its course. And guess what? I'm pregnant, finally. She sees it as a fulfillment of God taking away her shame. That's a very self-directed thought, isn't it? God heard my prayer and he's taking care of my shame. So I won't be ashamed to walk out among the women anymore. It's interesting how we think God is doing something just for us. And yet God's purposes were much bigger, weren't they? He was bringing somebody in to usher in the Messiah. And that was really a much bigger thing than taking away her shame of not having children. And yet, it's true as well. The Lord did take away her shame at the right time. So I think she hid for five months until she was showing, until people would believe her, because people are gonna go, <laughs> right, Elizabeth, listen, you've been wanting kids forever, you've been praying, I've been praying for you. Our cell group, our home group, our Bible study, and the temple, we're all praying for you, it's not happening. Why are you making up a story? I could just see, you know, having to explain it. So she waited for five months until she showed. And she goes, told you. <laughs> now in the sixth month, the antecedent is her pregnancy. So in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth. This might be a familiar story to you. To a virgin... By the way, that word virgin means virgin. Thought I'd let you know. Betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And having come in, the angel said to her, Rejoice, highly favored one. The Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. I could preach all day just on this passage alone. The angel Gabriel, the messenger angel, the good angel, the delivery, was sent by God to the city of Galilee in Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph. If you know anything about back then, there were a lot of those who were engaged. In fact, some of the children got engaged when they were two years old. Because your parents would talk to their parents, they'd make a deal, there would be a goat or something involved, and you would be engaged. Now, you could break that engagement if something happened or if some immorality was found. You could break that engagement, but, you know, you got to find a goat and give it back. You know, there's a whole thing. But then when you become betrothed, this is the one year before you get married. So Mary wasn't married. She was promised and of course, if something happens in that period of time, according to Jewish law, if you commit adultery or if you're found to be pregnant, the punishment is death. It's taken like a marriage, this betrothal. So it's serious business. She's betrothed to a man named Joseph. The virgin's name is Mary. And having come in, which tells me that she's inside, not outside. I look for pictures, you know, good pictures of Mary and of angels. What are these people thinking? You know, there's Mary out in the field all alone. There's Mary on steps. There's Mary here. There's Mary. He came in. He came in to where she was. So why are you thinking it's somewhere else? And an angel is never described as a female, ever. Gabriel's a man's name. Michael is a man's name. Lucifer. Ladies are good with that. No, I'm okay with that. <laughs> so, here, so why are these people doing all this crazy, stupid history stuff? Stealing our history. Makes me, I, I want to become an artist and draw them better. But so comes and says, highly favored one. The Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. It's interesting because I think 
in Catholic churches and in Protestant churches, I think Mary becomes a fixture, and I think people tend to overreact in one direction or the other. Either in the Catholic church, she's deified to the, as a co-redemptorist along with Jesus Christ, or in the Catholic church, we just say, ah, Mary's nothing, Jesus is somebody, you know, which is true. But she was selected by God, and she was said to be blessed above all women. No, among women, not above women, among women. That's what the scripture says. So as far as women are concerned, she's top shelf, but not over women, and certainly not over all of us. She was born naturally like the rest of us were. There was no virgin birth with her. And then, you know, if that's not good enough for you, you got to go back a few generations. Why was it important that she was a virgin? Because to break the power of sin, God had to step down and be the progenitor. Jesus is human, and yet he is God. Because it was God the Spirit, God the Father who was the Father, and it was Mary who was the human recipient. Jesus is both. And without both, you don't have somebody who can be a redeemer, and you certainly don't have God. But with Jesus, we do. That's why she had to be a virgin. The Lord is with you. In Ephesians 1, 6, here's an interesting passage. It says, to the praise of his glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved. By the way, highly favored one means accepted. So it's, this, it's the same word. It's, it's uh, transliterated differently in those two places, but it's the same word. So you could, you could put them side by side. And it's interesting that you are also a highly favored one, aren't you? According to the scripture. Same exact word, means accepted. But when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying. Interesting, Zechariah was scared to death that he saw an angel. Mary doesn't seem to be scared to death that she saw an angel. She's concerned with what he said. Isn't that interesting? I, I find these little gems and I'm excited. When she saw him, she was troubled at his saying. She wasn't troubled at his sight. She wasn't like in fear, you know, shaking like Zechariah was. And considered what manner of greeting this was. Like, why, why would you say that to me? Then the angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son. You have to know Mary is between 14 and 16 years old. Between 14 and 16 years old is the standard time when you betroth somebody, just so you know. So any of you have children who feel overly protective of them, I'm sure they're older than 14 or 16. You need to let go a little. Just saying. You will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the son of the highest, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom there will be no end. This angel knows the scripture quoting about John the Baptist and everything that he was going to be, and now quoting about Jesus and that he would be the son of God, since God's his father. He knows the scripture. He's, he's saying to her, you are going to bear the Messiah, the one who will save Israel, the one that was destined to come. That's quite an honor. And if you're a 14 to 16-year-old, I don't know about you, but when I was 14 to 16 years old, I wasn't thinking about angels or anything. So she must be a pretty sharp girl. And he announces this to her and she accepts it. She's not thrown by his appearance. She's, she's curious as to what, what kind of a greeting is this that you're greeting me with? I'm, I'm favored. When Mary said to the, to the angel, how can this be since I do not know a man? It sounds a lot like what Zechariah said. How can I know this? But Zechariah said, how can I know this? How, can, how am I supposed to believe that? 
since I'm old, and my wife's even older. How am I, how am I supposed to believe that? But she says, how can this be? In other words, how's it going to happen? What's the process? What's, what's the form? How is that going to happen since you know, since you're an angel, I've never been with a man? And that's how it all works, or so I'm told, <laughs> from 14 to 16 years old. And the angel answered her and said, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore, also the Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God. Now indeed, Elizabeth, your relative, has also conceived a son in her old age. And this is now the sixth month for who was she who was called barren. For with God, nothing will be impossible. And actually, verse 37 reads more rightly, no word shall be void of power. There's no word of God that is ever spoken that does not have power and does not ultimately end up doing exactly what he says it's going to do. And that's why he's mentioning Elizabeth. He's saying, the Holy Spirit's going to come upon you. You're going to give birth to the Son of God. He's going to be the Messiah. And oh, by the way, if you're having a little trouble understanding all that, you're, you know Elizabeth, your cousin? She's pregnant. You know the stricken one who's been barren all of her life? So if you need a little encouragement, if your faith needs just a little bit of a boost, go see Elizabeth because God can do the impossible. And so he gives her a reason to believe and he points her in that direction. Isaiah 7.14 says, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. You know, unto us a son is born, unto us a child is given. Unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. And the government will be upon his shoulder and he shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. It's like Christmas all over again. These are all the prophecies about the Messiah who would come to a young girl who would be a virgin and give birth to the Messiah to break the bonds of sin in our lives. Imagine the sacrifice, the cost of reputation, having to explain to your fiancé the words of the angel being a 14 to 16-year-old girl and explaining to your betrothed, I'm going to have a child, and it's not yours. And it's not anybody else's, it's God's. That's got to fall pretty hard on a woman who may have dreamed of having a family of her own, marrying this man and having a happy life. God steps in and births the Messiah. That has all kinds of complications, doesn't it? And now, what about her reputation as a good Jewish girl? Everyone's going to know that she's pregnant and she's not married. And that social climate was not good. Today, it's almost commonplace if you're in high school, you know, they have to make bigger desks for girls to scoot in because they're pregnant going to high school still. Imagine what she had to give up. Would you, if God called you to do something really big, would you be willing to set all that aside? And how do you explain that to your fiance and expect them to believe it? It's tough. And what about Jesus once he's born because he's always going to bear the stigma and the question mark, was he legitimate or whose father is he really? And if you don't think that that was a real struggle with Jesus, Think about the Pharisees. They started boasting about their father is Abraham, and Jesus was saying God is his father. And, and he's saying Abraham isn't your father. If Abraham was your father, you would do what your father did. But you do do what your father did. Your father is Satan because you do the things that he tells you to do. It says here in John 8, 41 to 42, you do the deeds of your father. And then they said to him, we are not born in fornication. We have one father who is God. And Jesus said to them, if God were your father, you would love me. For I proceeded forth and came from God. 
nor have I come of myself, but he sent me. You see, they accused Jesus of being illegitimate. We're not born of fornication. Questionable parentage. We know about you, Jesus. They question his parenting. And now Jesus is going to have to go through that all of his life. Imagine God asking you to give birth to his son. Imagine being pregnant in your old age. Some of you have gray hair. Imagine finding that out. I would be surprised. I'd probably be delighted, but I'd be surprised. And Mary said, Behold, the maidservant of the Lord, let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. Now Mary arose in those days, and she went into the hill country in haste to the city of Judah and entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. So the first thing Mary does after getting the, the word from the angel, she says, I'll do it. I hope everything happens exactly as you said it is. May it happen to me. That's bravery for a 14 to 16-year-old. That's selflessness. And we're going to see next week her Magnificat where she just expounds upon uh, the Lord and she magnifies the Lord how much scripture she knows. She's very rich in the word. And so she goes and she's now going to be greeting Elizabeth to see if it's true what the angel said. And it happened when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary as she came that the babe leaped in her womb. Do you remember how old the baby was? Six months plus whatever travel time there was. Did you know that a baby can hear at four months? A baby can hear at four months. I, I have all these facts and figures about babies and, and when they pick things up. But anyway, at 16 weeks, a woman's ovaries are fully formed in the womb so that she can reproduce. I just find things like that amazing. I, I don't want to go into all that, but it happened. Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary, and the babe leaped in her womb. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. By the way, she's filled with the Holy Spirit to, to do something. And she spoke out with a loud voice and said, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. But why is it granted to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For indeed, as soon as the voice of your greeting sounded in my ears, the babe leaped in my womb for joy. Blessed is she who believed, for there will be a fulfillment of those things which were told her from the Lord. How does she know all that? Because she was filled with the Spirit of God, and she knew these things. And she calls the unborn child Lord. And so I can imagine the conversation. So why did Mary leave and go? Probably because the angel told her about it, so there must have been a reason. But also remember, she's stricken in years, carrying a bun. She's already hunched over. So Mary goes to help. And Mary stays for three months to help her to deliver this baby. Isn't that awesome? There's a heart of service. Why did God choose her? Look at her character. God chose her because she was right. Leave it to a doctor to begin the announcement with two babies. <laughs> Dr. Luke begins the whole gospel with two babies. One who was a predecessor and one who is the Messiah who would come. And you can imagine how he got all this information, sat down with Elizabeth and got her take, sat down with Zechariah, got his take, sat down with Mary. Can you imagine that? What was Jesus like when he was young? Was he a rascal? <laughs> Did he ever fall and hurt himself? I can imagine the conversations and what a privilege it must have been for Luke to, to ferret out all this information and be able to write it down and over the years to be able to hand it to you and to me. What a benefit. 
I'm going to ask the worship team to come up. I'm going to pray. I'm really praying that the Lord revitalizes our hearts as we go through the scriptures and we look again at the life of Jesus and all of the facts that were taken up through the eyes of this Dr. Luke. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this time together today. I thank you for your word, which is so rich. Thank you for those who have come before, who by your spirit, you've inspired them to write these truths for us. Help us, Lord, to grow. Help us to be encouraged and strengthened that these examples who have gone before us, that we might follow their examples and avoid their pitfalls. We thank you, Lord, that in your grace that you came personally and you put on human skin and walked this life and lived a perfect life so that you might break the curse of sin in our lives. We thank you, Lord Jesus. We thank you for your grace. Help us to walk in it this week. In Jesus' name, amen.